Amen. That was good, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. It was rumored to me that Aiden was going to sing Great Balls of Fire and set the piano on fire. <laughs> I'm glad he did. We need the piano. Amen. Amen. Praise God for our children. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir, Brother Cotton. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles if you have them to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We'll begin today and read verses 8 and 9, verse 15, 16, and 17. You're welcome to stand up and honor reading God's Word. I know it's hot, but maybe even good enough to create a little breeze. Amen? <laughs> verse 8 of Genesis 2 said, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man in whom he formed. And out of the ground... The Lord God uh, made the Lord God to grow every green tree that is pleasant to the sight and is good for food. And the tree of life also is in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In verse 15 of Genesis 2, it said, The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Lord, we thank you for this time today, and thank you, uh, thank you, God, that we can see each other. It's something we take for granted so long, and being able to come to worship, we take that for granted too as well. So we thank you, God, for these precious folks that chose to come out in the heat and to worship you, and for those that can't. And those that are in their cars, God, thank you for all of them, God. Those that are home, tuned in via Facebook or uh, YouTube, God, we pray for them too as well. I pray that, God, that I'm so thankful that your word cannot return void. No matter how poorly I may deliver it, it cannot return void. Thank you, God. I'm Satan away from it. In your name, Jesus, we ask it all. Amen and amen. amen. So, <clears throat> what we see happening here is... The first thing in the Bible that God said it wasn't good was that man should be alone. We preached on that several times and made a point about it. But in verse 17 of Genesis 2 here, after he had <clears throat> told them what they had available to them in the garden, God uh, made this statement, and he said, Thou shalt not eat of it, of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as soon as we hear that as adults and as children... <coughs> We normally set about in our effort to prove that just because you told me not to, I'm going to try to. Uh, if you don't believe me, watch a group of children and watch the one of them that you tell him you can have everything in your room, but you cannot play with this toy right here. You watch him or her real close because the next thing you know, they've got their back turned to you against the wall and they're playing with that very thing that you forbid them to play with. Sin is in our nature. We are born into it, and, and uh, Adam and Eve are no different. I actually, it started with them and, and through the message that came from Satan like that. But we don't like to hear people tell us we can't do something, even when it comes from God. We just don't like that. We want to be able to do anything we want to do. And children are the same way. You can give them everything in the world, but the one thing you say, you can't have this, they don't like it. And so we're used to having so many things we don't understand that. But let's continue on with what God has for us today. Now over in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now verse 3 <clears throat> You're going to find out that Eve is not a real good listener. 
you're going to find out that she's not only a not, not a good listener, she can't even remember the name of a tree that's in the middle of the garden of the tree of good and evil. She can't remember that, so she just called it the tree in the midst of the garden in verse 3. And then she adds some words to what God said. You know, the Bible tells us we're not to take anything away from God's word, and we're not supposed to add anything to it. If you, if you pour out over the scriptures over there, you will not see where the God said that you cannot touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here's what Eve says. She's speaking with a devil that's standing upright right at this point. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it. God never said that, and neither did Adam. Lest you die. And when we run into verse 3, we see consequence. The first choice is given. That choice between good and evil. And God already knew what man was going to do. And that is the reason that he prepared his son Jesus Christ for us from the foundation of the world. That he would have to die for our sins. God knew exactly the choice that Adam would make. But in order to know how to defend yourself against the devil, you need to know the word. Now, Eva just had it spoken to her moments before, but yet she couldn't recall it even at that time. But verse 4 said, The serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely lie. Now, you all tell me out there in this crowd in the heat, is, it, is the devil a liar? Amen. So the first thing that comes out of his mouth here is, he's, is he is setting this up to tempt Eve in order to tempt Adam. Is he lies? The Bible says he's the father of lies. He says, you shall not surely die. So that's Satan's first attack on the word of God. So you can be assured, anytime you read any Bible verse about anything, that our adversary that walks about like a roaring lion is going to come against that, and he's going to have you put a big question mark up there about why did God say that? You start to analyze it and lean towards your flesh and do what God doesn't want you to do. An attack on the word of God. Remember Matthew chapter 4 when the Satan himself was standing in front of Jesus Christ, tempting him and offering him all kinds of things. And what was Jesus Christ's answer every time? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. If you want to fight Satan away in your life, you better know the word. You need to know the word. Verse 5, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened. You will be as gods, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, I brought some fruit today to maybe bring this message home to help you understand this. So, these, this, this is, these are all fruits that came off of a tree. There's an apple, came off of a tree. There's an orange came off of a tree, there's a plum, came off of a tree, there's a something shining red, came off a tree, amen, that's a nectarine, there's a peach, and a banana. Now it bothers us, or it might, might bother you when I say, you know what, Thomas Thompson, I love you, and I know you're hungry right now, but you can have everything up here but this apple. Thomas ain't going to like that. To him, hey, it's just fruit. Don't you think that's what Eve thought, maybe? It's just, it's just a piece of fruit. But when God says, you can't have it, don't do it, he means it. Amen? He means it. It's not just a piece of fruit to him. It brings about all kinds of sin. And every one of these things came out of some kind of a seed that's similar to the sun that are in this basket that has a red bandana in it, and it grew into, ended up being a piece of fruit like this. So it's just a piece of fruit to me and you, but to God is disobedient. So this first partake of, of the, something that we're not supposed to, to take brought sin into the world. That's what Adam did. Now, can you go back and don't raise your hand because you'll embarrass yourself. Can you go back to the first time that you ever tried alcohol? Seemed harmless the first time, amen. 
but it's not. First time you ever tried drugs in your life. It seemed harmless just the first time, but it's not. The first time that you got involved in gossip with someone, it seems harmless, but it's not harmless. The first lie that you ever told, did it really seem like that big a deal? No, but have you set yourself forth as a, a liar? You see, God takes sin, disobedience, very, very seriously. So quit trying to analyze which one that he told you not to have and try to figure out why, but just do what God says when he says stay away from something. Stay away from something. You know why? Because he knows your tomorrow. He knows your tomorrow, which is what you don't know. But thank God that Satan doesn't know your tomorrow. And also, it's a good time to go ahead and touch on this one while we're here. There's some people that think that abortion is harmless. Well, I'm here today to take the Word of God and prove to you that that's wrong. Abortion is not harmless. I hope you can hear me out there in that crowd. Amen? I hope the United States of America citizens can hear me right now that the Word of God is against abortion. We're going to share some scripture about that. But think about abortion in, in another sense this morning that we'll deal with. Because here's what happens. Let me continue to read scripture. In Genesis 3, verse 14, we've already been, I don't have to read all the scripture to tell you that as God confronted Adam and he confronted Eve, that Adam blamed his wife and Eve blamed the serpent. And it goes on down that God has a punishment for them. In Genesis 3, verse 14, he starts out with the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And here's where Satan is forced to go to the ground as a serpent on the ground instead of standing upright. And upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of thy life. And verse 15 is where I want to focus on a few minutes. And he said, I will put enmity, which that means I will put an opposite. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and it will bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What are we talking about in this particular piece of scripture? Every since that Satan has entered into the picture, he has been our adversary. He has been our enemy. And God is saying, look, because of what you've done, there will always be a difference between you woman and Satan your enemy and he starts out he, he, he embraces birth here he said there's a difference between your seed and her seed the seed of Satan is the seed of sin any idea that you've ever had to go through your mind about doing something sinful about doing something wrong let me tell you that did not come from God Satan himself planted that seed into your heart and into your mind amen but he said, there's a difference, there's an enmity, there's a, there's a battle, there's hostility between you and Satan. And we ought to feel that way about Satan. He is our enemy. We should hate him. Amen? But then he tells us that we're going to be victorious. He says, Satan, you're, you're going to bruise the heel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you bruise somebody's heel, that is not a killing blow. But if you damage their head, that's a killing blow. And he said, and you'll bruise his heel. In other words, Christ will stomp on you and defeat you. If you ever saw the Passion of the Christ, the beginning of that movie, it shows Christ's foot coming down on the head of Satan himself. But what's all this mean when I talk about abortion as I read these things about your seed and her seed? Well, I want you to see something today. can't pick this seed up on camera because it's so small. I've got just a piece of it in the end of my finger. I want you to know today that Satan's intention is that no child ever breaks forth out of the womb. Satan wants all children to die. Amen? He doesn't even want them to be born. Those of you that are here today, you ought not ever you ought not ever side with abortion for any reason. For no reason. Think of the beautiful children that were just up here on stage 
it was, I guarantee you, it was Satan's intention that they not ever make it this far in life. He raised up Pharaoh in Exodus 1. kill the male children from the Hebrew women. Herod, when Christ was born, he saw to it that all the babies between two years old and under were put to death. You see, here's the thing about it. Satan didn't know who Jesus Christ was at that point. He doesn't have the wisdom that God had. He doesn't know how these beautiful children that came up on the stage he doesn't know which one of them is going to be another Moses. He doesn't know which one's going to be another Paul. He doesn't know which one's going to be another Matthew, another Joshua, another Jacob. He doesn't know who's going to be an Elizabeth, a Mary, a Martha. He doesn't know those things. So he's going to pour out everything that he can on the lives of these children continually and challenge you as moms and dads to not bring them to church, to not put them in front of God's word. He didn't want him to see him grow up. But he would have been happier, you all, if some of you parents out there would have aborted these children so they would have never come up here and sung praises unto the one that's the King of King and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Do you not think today, church, that God heard these precious souls sing, Jesus loves me? God heard that. And Satan hates it because he hates these children. He hates them. So they're tiny, yes, up on this stage. They're tiny seeds. But they can grow up to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. So don't ever side with Satan in that. But listen to a couple of scriptures about this. Exodus 20, 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. In the Hebrew, that means, in that word kill right there, and I won't try to, try to pronounce the Hebrew word for it, because I can't do it and do it respect. But it means to dash in that particular verse. You can look it up yourself. It means to dash to pieces, and in quotations especially, to murder. Isn't that what they do when they reach inside of a womb and they rip a child to pieces? Amen? Yeah. That's called murder. That's called killing. Jeremiah 1.5, he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Psalm 127 5 said, Children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And I love Proverbs 6 7 about this. The Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. To me, there's no more innocence. There's no more innocence in the world than a baby that's in the womb. Satan agrees with ripping them out of their mother's stomach. Be careful that you don't ever side with Satan in the killing of children. Be careful with that. Now we'll continue to read on in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 16, the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. He wasn't supposed to be painful to bear children. In sorrow you'll bring forth children and, des and your desire shall be to thy husband. He'll rule over thee. You lost your true equal rights at that point. Unto Adam he said, Because you've hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and you've eaten of the tree which he commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Now something you might need to go back and just chew on just for a second. Remember in verse 6, Genesis 3, and maybe I didn't read it, but I'm going to read it again. I did. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she gave also to her husband with her, with her, he was with her at the time, and he did eat. What does that tell you today and tell me? Satan, never, excuse me, sin never affects just you. What you give in to you can very easily persuade someone close to you to participate in. Your friend is doing some things that they shouldn't do. If you hang with them very long, you'll be doing them yourself. He, she passed it right on to Adam, and what did he do? Being a man and being weak in the flesh, he gave in 
and so sin has been passed to us. Now move to Genesis 3, verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face you'll eat bread, till you return unto the ground. For out of it you were taken, and dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. So in other words, in verse 19, man got his sentence of death, and we received it. Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, we find out the first time that nature is affected by sin. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skin and clothe them in order to cover up their nakedness. First animals lost their life. So the seed of death goes on and on. It's passed on to us. It's been passed on to nature. It's been passed on to everything since the existence of man because of the seed of disobedience. Verse 22. Excuse me, Genesis 3. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. You know, good and evil. Now, who's this us? It's the Trinity. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even though Christ was there in the flesh, yet you can be aware that he was alive in heaven itself. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. This verse can be very confusing, and I want to maybe explain it this way. Look at Romans chapter 5 in your Bibles, if you have your Bible. If you don't, I say it all the time, then you have to take my word for it. Romans 5 12. Wherefore, if by one man sin entered into the world, it's talking about Adam, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, if you don't know it's wrong, it's not sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. After the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of many, of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ has abandoned unto many. Not as it was by one that sinned, so it is the gift. For the judgment was by one to con condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses and the justification. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What that means to you today, along with this verse is that once the sentence of death was passed on to Adam in this particular piece of scripture God cannot go back on his word if God tells you if you were to die today not accepting me as Lord and Savior, and if you die, I promise you, according to the Word of God, you'll go straight to a devil's hell. But he also keeps his word when it comes to life. If you realize that you are a sinner and ask him in your heart for forgiveness, he will save you and he will keep your word, keep his word rather, so that you have a home in heaven. God could not go back on his word as much as Adam wanted to stay in the Garden of Eden. We'll read about that. So verse 23 said, Therefore the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now, Adam didn't want to leave the Garden of Eden. He had it made there. He still had it made. But what did God do? Verse 24, he drove out the man. He sent him forth, he didn't leave, so God had to drive him out. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubims, angels with flaming swords, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Matthew Henry made this statement. If Adam and Eve had ate of the tree of life, they would have lived forever on earth as sinners, and God would have broken his word because they had the sentence of death on themselves. They had to die. Romans 3.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. 
gives to God is eternal life. My Lord. The wages of sin is death. That may be Romans 3 26. I'm not making it up. You can tell me after service. Amen. What does this have to do with you today? When it mentions the thorns that came from a seed that we showed last Sunday morning, you saw thorn seeds that developed into thorns, developed into pain. John 19 2 says this. That the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and they put it on the head of Jesus Christ. Those thorns represent sin. Did he sweat? Yes. Probably worse than I am right now. Luke 22 44 said, Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were as great drops of blood falling to the ground. Sorrow. All these things are brought in by sin. Sorrow, Isaiah 53, said he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief and death. Hebrews 2 9. Said, we see Jesus. He was who was made a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? That means that he was in, he came to earth 100 percent God and 100 percent flesh. He was made a little lower than angels for what, what reason? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. <laughs> Romans 10, 13, said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have an adversary, and he's continuing to attack you, and he will, till God calls you home. Until Christ comes back first. Quit allowing the seeds of sin to get into our lives and to the lives of our children. You prove the day in your attendance on a hot, humid Sunday morning that you're interested in what the Word of God says. The Bible says we're to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. My former pastor said, I'm not just up here bumping my gun. We have to obey what God's Word says. If Adam and Eve had to obey, there would have never been pain. There would have never ever been a tear shed. There would have never been an animal that lost its life. There would have never been a plant that would ever die. Everything was all about life. God would have had His own way to grow everything we need. But we made a choice, and God gave us one. He knew that, and he sent Jesus. If you don't know him today, you're welcome at invitation time to come walking up here. Brother Mike, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've never been saved. I've got some questions about things. I'll be glad to sit down with you and take the word of God. Explain to you how to be saved. Maybe you need to pray. You're welcome to stay right where you're at. We'll pray. You're welcome to come up here. We'll pray with you. Whatever you need today. But let's try our best as a group of fellow believers to not sow any more seeds of doubt when it comes to the Word of God. We get to feast on the tree of life. We get to feast on Jesus Christ. The cross looked like a tree of death. That's what made our sin death. And it was made out of a tree that God himself Planted in the ground and grew up and was cut down.